I'm Mark Smith. Uh, been with Wells Fargo Advisors for over a year. They recruited me right out of UBS Financial. Uh, it was one of the largest private banks in the world. I was there for 16 years. And I started my career as a financial advisor um, you know, about 16, 17 years ago. Played a little football, played a defensive end for the Fordham Rams. So um, what, a big part of my practice is talking to a lot of your uh, husbands and, and, and boyfriends and, and partners and letting them know a little bit about what they should be avoiding and what they should be getting into. So I'm going to give you a little information um, on what I tell many of them when I go around the league, because I'm, I'm asked by a few of the teams to go and speak to some of the rookies. And unfortunately, you guys aren't in the room. You ladies aren't in the room for those, for those talks. And so I'm hoping that I can kind of give you some of the information that I share with them. Um, the number one thing that I want, I, I always stress when I talk to the players, is that budgeting is paramount. So if you go and talk to them, and when you get back home, and yeah, and you all should know every month what number you spend every single month, like your phone number, okay? If it's 10,000, if it's 8,000, if it's 6,000, it should be 6,500, really, 6,540, 8,320. It should be exact numbers. And so budgeting is a big part of all this because unfortunately, when you're making a lot of money, if you don't adhere to a budget, you, t you sometimes live with what you have in your checking account. And what happens is, as you all know, the average player is in the league three or four years. And so you really have to create a budget that you can sustain after football. And so that's one thing that you all can help with. You have a lot of power with this topic because I see successful players uh, financially after football, a lot of the reasons is because of their partners that really stress that budgeting aspect about talking about life after football. And so if you don't have a budget, it gets out of control really quickly with spending. You don't know if you're really spending enough. You're trying to keep up with the Joneses, which is one of, one of the authors talked about. I always talk about that with the players, is that you know, um, although someone next to you may be making $10 million, at $250,000, that's still a ton of money. And I, uh, I bring that up in this slide, is that even though it may, not, it may seem, listen, I'm on, I'm, on the, I'm on the practice squad, or we don't have a, a long-term deal, this is, this, these are the numbers. You are the top 1% of Americans on the practice squad in the NFL. Okay, so let's put things in perspective. I know everyone's, you know, hanging out with folks that are making tons more, and, but that's okay. But when you think about it in retrospect, 99% of Americans don't have what you do. And so there's a lot of power in having that kind of money and responsibility in having that kind of money. And so if you do, you're not having this budget conversation and having it on a monthly basis with your partners, there's no way that you can invest. Because you only can invest capital. If you're spending all the time and you're bleeding all the time, you can't do it. And a lot of folks are like, how can I not get ahead? Reason because there's no budget in place and they don't adhere to it. So I'm gonna teach you a little bit about how to really quickly what, what that budget should entail. Fixed expenses and variable expenses. The fixed expense is everything that's gonna come up every single month, all the way down from the cell phone bill to the Netflix to the rent of the mortgage. And so that's that number that you should have all the time in your mind uh, with your partners and talk about that and make sure you're adhering to that. And it has to be a monthly conversation. You know, I talk to, about it every single month with my wife. What's, what, you know, how are we on with the, with the budget? I like to say that we're always under budget, right? Because you can do that. You know, um, if you're not spending a lot on groceries or uh, if you're not doing something with the, uh, with the fuel costs, if you get solar panels, all that stuff can lower your fixed expenses every single month. It doesn't have to just go up. But you really have to have these conversations and have it on a monthly basis and not wait for after the fact what happened this year. And then you go to your advisor and you find out you, didn't, you have a lot less money than you thought. You should be uh, uh, looking at these statements monthly, like a homework assignment. Um, and it should be in your calendar on the 31st of each month, budget conversation. Let's print out all the statements. Let's print out all our, um, our checking accounts and look at, look at these, let's see what's going on line items. If you're not doing that, it's gonna be really hard to do that, that, the fun stuff about my job, which is, which is invest. Uh, let's see if I can get to that next slide. Um, we're gonna go right back one. Let's see, does that work? Can I go back one more? Thank you. Thank you. So when, when, you, when you invest and you budget, you have to have an emergency savings account, okay? A lot of folks are like, okay, what does that mean? If you don't have that budget thing worked out, there's no way you know what your emergency account is. Because if you're spending $10,000 a month, your emergency account should be six to eight months of budget expenses saved up in cash. And that's always an account that you don't even look at, you don't have access to, it's just there for emergencies. Six to eight times. Now if uh, if, you're, if your partner's the only sole breadwinner, it should be a little bit more than that, to be honest with you. If you are both working, 
then it could be that six to eight months. And we just saw from the pandemic how important that emergency account is. If there's no money coming in, that was an emergency. You go into your emergency account and you could at least have about a you know eight month runway to live on without having to start calling people for favors. And so that, that account is so important. Um, after you have that saved up, then you can invest. And this, this chart here talks a little bit about what that means. If you have $100,000, it could be 10,000, it could be 5,000, just using for round numbers. This is what you should be thinking about when you invest. Worst case scenario, I, I make uh, $10,000. Best case scenario, I have 165. That's a conservative portfolio, all bonds. Second example, worst case scenario, I invest $100,000, I get back $100,000, best case, $175,000. That's a moderate portfolio. And then best case, and then the third case is best case scenario, $200,000, you doubled your money. Worst case, you went down $70,000. That's a really aggressive portfolio. So when people are asking, your advisor asking you, what's your risk tolerance? This is what they're talking about. Are you willing to lose money in any given year? Are you gonna freak out about it? And so if your question is, yeah, I'm gonna freak out about it, you should be in that number one category, that conservative category. If you're okay with your $100,000 going down to $70,000, you're actually a pretty aggressive person and you can actually take some risk and go into the market and make some money. So keep this in mind, you can take a picture of it. And so when you have these conversations with your, with your spouse, you can let them know, okay, this is the type of investors we are. So when we talk to our advisors, we can know how much risk we're willing to take. And you have that conversation with your partner um, through hours of conversation about everything, right? It's about how, the lifestyle you want. How, how can you afford to not touch this money? Because um, if you can't afford to touch the money, then uh, you can't really invest. You, you, you really can't be in equities, in stocks, if you, if you can't see your portfolio deviate. We all see what's happening this year. This is the worst start in the S&P 500 since the Great Depression. Nobody's talking about that in the media, but it's just numbers. They don't want, nobody wants to scare you to death. But this is a fact. So right now, you should be in and thinking about, did I get, was I in the stock market? Because if not, there's a lot of discounts right now. Anybody ever heard of Amazon? That's down like 40%. And I don't know about you, I didn't stop using it. Apple, how many people have an iPhone? Okay, that's down 25%. You know, and that, that company has 50% market share in the US. What other product do you know that one out of two people use in America? Apple, all right, so it's down 25%. That's a great company to invest in. So these are all companies that are on discount, even though we are a worse start since the Great Depression to the equity markets. That should be saying to you, there's some stuff on sale. If you walked into Louis Vuitton and things were 40% off, would you be thinking about it twice or would you be calling your girls and being like, we need to get down to Louis Vuitton and get all these damn purses and bags. So that's what I'm trying to tell you about what's going on in the equity market right now. Okay, this is a big opportunity. So if you've been sitting in cash and not thinking about investing, this is the right time to start what I call dollar cost averaging, which means you put a little bit away every single month in the market. So if I had $100,000, I'm not putting all $100,000 today based on what I'm saying. I'm saying put 5,000 in. And then let's see what happens two months later. Put another 5,000 in. That's dollar cost averaging. So a lot of folks, unfortunately, in the NFL, when they get these huge checks, they give it to advisor. Okay, I did it, I'm good, I'm invested. Well, what many of these advisors do is they just put the whole money in the market that one day. Why? Well, they get paid on it. So you gotta let them know, we wanna do it slowly. Put, we give you a million dollars, we wanna put you, have you know, 50,000 in every three months. And you dollar cost average in, that way you're not possibly going in at the worst possible time. Can you imagine the people who invested in the market in January, how they feel right now? And they had no upside, okay? Because they didn't have all the like three, four years. So if a player just got, out the, uh, just got in the league, got a contract, invested in January, they're down 25%. What do you think that's doing to their psyche, right? So you have to be prepared to stay in it for the long term. Um, and so when you're investing, this is a great slide. So the next thing is your habits, um, planning it for tomorrow. Big part, and what I, just talked a little bit about is having that mindset. And that's a, a, a unit thing. You both have to have the mindset. You can't have one person doing one thing, the other person off doing something else. So you all have to try to figure out how you get on that mindset to know that life after football is coming sooner than you think. And so, and I'm sure a lot of folks can attest to that who their, their uh, partners were not uh, in the league very long, that if you don't have that mindset ready, it can hit you like a brick. And so you gotta have that mindset why in the league and, and after about budgeting, managing, all that. And then, and then keep that with your behavior. 
right? So a lot of my players go on vacation. And some of them have gotten money for going on vacation. So it's just a mindset thing. How does that happen? Well, you got 100,000 100, Instagram followers. You call up a hotel in the place you want to go and talk to their uh, marketing people. They may give you a, fr a few free, uh, free nights. They may pay for your flight. But you have to have the mindset in not spending, but earning. And so that's what that is. And that impacts your behavior. All right? And that all details your money story. So I'm going to talk a little bit about life after football. Um, and then I'm going to get into this a little bit, uh, this S&P 500. I'm going to leave it at that. But life after football should be a conversation that you talk about the minute you get signed a contract. You know, it should be what is that next plan? Am I going to be, am I going to try to get a career in sports, which a lot of players that I work with do? They go back and coach. They go back and train. They, they go into the media. Um, some of them are entrepreneurs. But what I'm saying is you can't figure it out after football is over. you got to be doing it while you're playing. And so if you're going to go to school, try to go to school in the off season. Don't wait till football is over. Try to get some classes. Get, get that mindset in that you're, gonna go, that you're having a plan in place so that when football eventually ends, and you know, many, of, many of the players I work with, sometimes they find out the day that it ends. And they, and they, try, and they think it's going to come back around. It never does. So you have to have that plan in place where, okay, good. I, I took what the league gave me. Thank you so much. Doing better than 99% of America. Let me go out and now focus on the rest of my life and in the career. So if you're always thinking about that, even when you're in the league, I think from a psychological perspective that I've seen with the players is a lot more helpful when they know what they're going to do after. So always be talking about what's that going to be? What's that going to be? What's that going to be? And, and so everyone in this room can spur these conversations in, in a nice, tactful way where you're just saying, hey, what, what do you, what, what's your passion? What do you want to do? What's going what's to make us some money after that? Um, also, all of you in this room have the, have the capability of presenting ideas. And that's a very powerful position. Um, and so when you're doing that, make sure you're doing your homework. If, if you're talking to an advisor, make sure that you look them up on FINRA.org. This is a site that's for free, F-I-N-I-R-A, and see if the advisor you're working with is credible. Have they been sued? Have they went to jail? Have they gotten a customer complaint because they told, the customer told them that I wanted to do X and they did Y? All that's on FINRA.org. I've been in the industry for 18 years on Wall Street. I have no customer complaints. Okay, so it's possible to find someone that hasn't messed up in case somebody tells you, tells you something else. So that's a very important thing. Fees, another very important thing. Okay, because no one wants to talk about that. Oh, you know, feel, feel good, we went out to a nice dinner. We're going to work with this person. No one knows how much they're paying the guy. You have to know what the fees are, and it's got to be explicitly explained in detail before you do anything. And then you should be able to compare that to someone else. If the agent refers you to someone, make sure you get someone the agent didn't refer you because it's a checks and balance. I'm not saying you have to be like me. I've been doing this for 20 years but I'm, and know how much about, uh, anything about Wall Street. But what you can do is have people looking at each other to compare, is this person giving you the right advice or not? Because I'd be able to tell you, if you work on an advisor now and you say, you know what, let me have Mark look at my stuff. I may tell you three things you didn't know about your, and I'll do that pro bono. You know, you just call me and say, hey Mark, here's a statement, what do you think? You know, and you should be doing that, it doesn't have to be me, it should always have someone looking at someone else's back to make sure if you don't know and you don't have the core competency to know something, someone else that is in a competitive position to them can do that work for you, right? If you're, getting a real, if you're doing a real estate deal, just don't talk to one agent that your agent referred you to. Call someone out the blue. Hey, this is a contract we're about to sign. We're about to you know, buy a million dollar house. Have them look over each other, make sure that you're not paying too high of a commission. You know, maybe the title insurance is too high. Maybe, you know, with your real estate attorney, make sure someone's looking over that work. Hey, just want to get an idea. What would you charge for this? Everything that you do has to be put out to competitive bid, in my opinion. Everything. Every advisor, every accountant, everything. Because that way, you don't have to worry about, am I getting screwed? Am I paying too much? Is this person doing the right thing? Because you've already farmed it out to one or two other credible people that can do that work for you and say, hey, listen, here's some loopholes right here that this person didn't think about. Because anyone in my position who's trying to get more clients is going to look for things that the other person's not doing properly and is going to try to explain that to you in order to win your business. You don't have to leave. You can still continue to work with the person. But isn't it nice to know you, don't, you didn't have to do the homework to figure out where all the, uh, the issues were? 
And so that's what I would always say, put things out to competitive bid, make sure people are looking over the people that you trust, because sometimes you find out later down the road they weren't someone you should trust, and so it's better to do it right away and always have this process in place that you have someone looking over that person's back. Also, don't give anyone power of attorney on any of your accounts. Okay, I've seen a lot of uh, fraud in the industry, and you can Google all the players have gotten taken advantage of because their agent, their manager has power of attorney because people don't want to sign a check. You not sign that check can mean you just lost 100 grand. And get in line with all the other people suing the person that just took the money from you. All right, so make sure you can do all that. Those are some, some cautionary tales I've seen. Um, and then I'm going to this. U.S. markets, this is a, a little description of what happened in the S&P 500 since 1965. So if anyone is questioning about, hey, maybe I should do Bitcoin, maybe I should you know, invest in a restaurant, Bitcoin just lost 70% of its value in three months. Most restaurants go out of business. S&P 500 has gone up consistently, decade after decade, for, since 1965, going all the way back since inception. So if, if, if you have any question about, hey, listen, I don't know what to invest in, I don't know what kind of business I want to run, don't overthink it. This has returned 9% annually, year over year, for the last eight decades, okay? So sometimes businesses only make 4%, 5%. The average restaurant interest, uh, you make 5% interest. If you're a landlord, if you do the math and you break all the numbers down, you might be making 5 to 6% a year on your initial investment. This is 9%. This is why some of the wealthiest people in the world invest on Wall Street and don't um, get stuck into the morass of real estate, entrepreneurship, trying to flip, st all, all that stuff. This is consistent. You don't have to think about it. It goes up as long as you're a long-term investor. And so I'm gonna stop it with that if, and, and with my last minute to see if there's any questions. Because I don't wanna, yeah. As you just spoke about Bitcoin dropping 70%, so that was something I know a lot of people that invested in, they were doing extremely well. Yeah. So do you feel, I was always thinking about getting into it, do you feel like now that it is that low, is the time to get into it? I, I personally think that anything that you don't understand, you shouldn't invest in. I agree. So I don't know what Bitcoin is, I don't know how it's made, if it disappeared tomorrow, I don't know who to call to get my money back. That's that. That's typical. That's the, always a good rule of thumb. If you don't understand something, don't invest in it. Yeah. Any? Yeah. First of all, Mark, you are the business. Oh, like, thank you. ladies, pay attention to this man. I've worked in the NFL and represented players for 25 years. He knows what he's talking about. Um, but one thing that I would love for you to uh, tell the ladies is what is a general percentage that financial advisors take? Because I still even have clients, they have no idea what they're paying their financial advisors. So I think that's something that definitely needs that little curtain to be opened, especially today for these ladies to know, well, what, what should we be paying? Right. That's a good question. Uh, so the average advisor would charge you in the industry 1% on assets under management. Okay, 1%. Now, that, we have discretion on that, and the bank has discretion on that. So if you have $10 million with one firm, you should not be paying 1%. You should be getting a way bigger discount than that. I think the max discount that any of these major firms can give is the 50 basis points a year, and that's typically with a $25 million account or more. Um, but anything under $3 million, you're going to be paying around that 1% annually. Um, but, but again, some advisors will want the business really well and will, and will work with you and say, listen, I know this is your first contract. Maybe you may not get a second. I'll do it for you for 0.75% a year. That would be an amazing rate if you saw someone charge you 0.75. Um, but the really good advisors who are doing a lot to the business, possibly being a, um, paying bills and organizing your uh, travel, this and that, there's advisors who do all that, they may charge more, and, and the max you should be paying is 1.5. A lot of people don't know that mutual funds charge fees too. So if you have an advisor who's buying you mutual funds, you're paying the advisor 1% and the mutual fund company's charging you as well. So the aggregate fees too. So if you, if you have mutual funds in your account and you have an advisor, you should be asking the advisor, what, what value are you bringing to the table? Because I could buy a mutual fund at Fidelity for free. Okay, my clients own all stocks. So you're not paying an annual, uh, a management fee and we're buying index funds, stocks and index funds, and individual bonds. Anyone ever heard of a municipal bond? 
Those are tax-free income for you, federal, state, and local, if you live in the city and live in the state that you're buying the bonds from. So you should definitely be looking into that because in this period of instability, you could be making 4% triple tax-free, which means 4% sounds whack until you're in the highest tax bracket. And then it's like you're making eight, seven and a half, eight percent. That's called a tax equivalent yield. No one thinks about tax equivalent yield because if a CD in a bank is charging you two, you're paying taxes on that two. So it's really like you're making 1.25. But in munis, municipal bonds, if they make four, it's like you're making six and a half. So um, definitely consider all that. But thank you for the question on the fees. And that's there's ways you can lower the fees by talking to your advisor and aggregating assets. If you have one advisor here, one advisor there, one advisor there, you're probably going to be paying that higher fee. If you consolidate all your assets, there's a lot of negotiating power in your fees when you consolidate all your assets with one advisor. So that's a, another good thing to, uh, to know when you're talking about fees. Thanks for the question. Anybody else? And then I, I'm probably going to get kicked off. Okay. Yeah. Having been married to an NFL player, when you, like you said in the beginning, when you hear financial advisors or you see them come in, you kind of don't want to hear what they have to say. And so how did you leave a place like UBS and go to Wells Fargo? Because typically for me, I'm thinking, you know, I need my um, advisor to either be independent with a l nice firm or either um, Morgan Stanley or UBS. So Wells Fargo to me is like a bank. So like I don't want a bank financial advisor, you know? So how, how can I have a paradigm shift to feel like you can offer me the same things that I could get from UBS? Yeah, um, so that's a great question. First, all these major firms she's mentioning, Mer Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, UBS, uh, Wells Fargo Advisors, which is the wealth management arm of the bank, so it's not like the, you know, you're going off into a teller. These are the firms you really should be considering working with instead of these other shops that you may not have heard of. Why, is, why am I saying that? Well, if something ever happens at some of these shops because they have no compliance office, because no one's looking over their back, uh, who are you getting in, you're getting in line with 30 people to sue. Remember Bain Bernie Madoff? All those people got in line and waited and, get, and got 20 cents on the dollar. If you sue Wells Fargo, you're getting 100% of whatever you lost. You sue UBS, you get 100% of whatever you lost. So these big firms are kind of where the safety is. Um, so I would only be considering these major firms for the most part because of that one reason. Um, but there are plenty of advisors that are at other firms, but I just think you're taking a risk when it comes to your money, right? You want to be able to go to the person with the biggest pot and say, hey, listen, I had it wrong, make it right. And they don't want you to go to New York Times, right? If, you, if you're getting in line with someone else with 30 other NFL players, and that's the whole guy's client list, and he was stealing from all of you, you know, you're going to get online and wait years to get your money. But when, it, when, when, so when thinking about working with an advisor, I do think it's a personal decision. So whether it's at an independent RIA or one of these large brokerage houses that I'm talking about, the person you work with, I think, sets the tone for the relationship because they're going to be the one you talk to every day. They're going to be ones who gives you instruction on how to invest. And so you have to just do your homework and make sure you're working with the right person. I was at UBS for 15 years and I went to Wells Fargo because they were looking for African-American talent. They were very blunt with me. They had the CEO of Wells Fargo call me and say, hey, I know you've been you know, killing it at, well, at UBS. We need you to come to Wells Fargo. We're going to pay you a ton of money. It's hard to be for me with my family to say no to that. <laughs> but I was trained at one of the best wealth management firms in the world. And I'm still taking that knowledge and taking it to a bank who, by the way, has some of the best mortgage rates in the country. So I was able, over the last year and a half, to secure my clients with 2%, 2.8% mortgages, 30-year fixed. I couldn't do that at, at UBS. So there was a, something in it for my clients. And I think that if any advisor leaves from one firm to the other, they should be able to articulate clearly why they did that and why it makes sense for you. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, Mark.